This lecture is going to cover the topics of promoting asepsis and preventing infection. This is actually going to be really important as you um, are practicing as nursing students, studying in school, and begin working with patients. Also, as you move into your career as nurses, we're going to go over several things in this lecture. As you're going through, if you think of any questions, I want you to jot those down. When we get to the end, if your questions haven't been answered and there's more things you want clarification of, please feel free to email me, respond um, to the discussion board, or, or send a request, give me a call, schedule an appointment in my office hours, and I'll be happy to clear up anything that you just um, need some further understanding of. So let's dive into asepsis and preventing infection. So what is asepsis? Basically, when we think about asepsis, it is the absence of illness producing microorganisms. So if something is asepsis, then it's cl very clean. There's no germs, no bacteria. The way this is actually achieved is through hand hygiene, pretty much. Um, and there's some other things that we can do to make stuff asepsis, but the primary behavior that we do is washing our hands. Um, so asepsis really means that something is very clean. It doesn't have any bacteria, anything, any microorganisms, anything that's going to cause somebody to be ill. Now, there are two different ways, um, types of asepsis. One is medical asepsis. Medical asepsis is really using very precise, particular um, practices to reduce the spread of bacteria, disease, virus, microorganisms. But basically, it means making stuff clean. Now, we use a medical asepsis when we're administering medicines, when we're doing our skills, when we're providing our hand hygiene when we're taking care of our patients. A lot of the basic things that we do with nurses, we use medical asepsis because we're always going to make sure that we're washing our hands and everything is clean um, whenever we are taking care of our patients. Now, surgical asepsis is a little bit different than medical asepsis because when we're doing um, any kind of surgical procedures, assisting with that kind of stuff, or patients in the OR, or there's something, an object that's going into the patient's body like a foreign object we really want to make sure that we have eliminated all um, microorganisms make sure there's no bacteria no viruses anything that can um, harm the patient the other thing is we need to make sure that all the area around it the space that we're using and stuff does not have um, microorganisms and we want to make sure that we're not contaminating it <clears throat> so the area that we're going to use around our patient for like procedures like fully catheter and um, I think sometimes wound care things of that nature is called sterile technique um, not necessarily every time do you use sterile technique with wound care that's more for like surgical wounds and things um uh, if you're going to give um medication in an IV that's going straight to the patient's veins you need to make sure that we're really using that sterile technique for that too with our gloves and cleaning scrubbing the hub um, and um, uh, sometimes when we're doing trach care that's another technique that's very sterile when um, doctors may go in we may assist with them especially if you're working in the emergency room to like um, do some wound care Sometimes they may put in central lines. There are several things that we'll do that require surgical asepsis, but most of the time, what you're going to be doing as a nurse is medical asepsis. Now that we know what asepsis is, let's talk a little bit about infection. This is not new content. I'm sure this is something that you remember from your previous courseworks and studies. But what is infection? When microorganisms that are capable of producing disease and illness invade our body, begin to attack us, infection occurs. 
These microorganisms that cause the infections, we refer to them as pathogens. I'm sure this is something you remember from pathophysiology. Now, there are different types of pathogens. We have bacteria, we have viruses, there are fungus, there's proteins that can be pathogens, parasites um, can also be pathogens. So just I just want to mention it just a um, few minutes here. Some common bacteria that we see is like Staphylococcus aureus, E. coli, and there's a mycobacterium that causes tuberculosis. In um, the healthcare setting, these are some of the common ones that you'll see. The other thing um, that you'll probably see is viruses. Now, viruses, they need a host so they can copy and reproduce material. Common viruses that you might see in um, nursing, HIV, hepatitis, herpes zoster, herpes simplex. In relation to fungus, um, you may see this a couple of times. Uh, patients may have um, candida, um, aspergillus, that's another common um, fungus that you'll see that your patients may have. It's something that um, you may see um, patients have fu uh, fungus in their mouth, in their skin folds, um, in their genital area, and we have to make sure that we are treating this with the right medication. That's why it's important to understand the pathogen so we know how to really treat our patients. Sometimes proteins can cause um, um, bad proteins called prions. Protein particles can cause some disease. One thing we see is the Crutzfield Jacobs disease. That's caused by some protein particles. And then last but not least is where we'll see like parasites, protozoan, um, worms, um, malaria is one thing that's caused by a parasite. Toxoplasmosis is caused by parasites. So rarely, um, but, it, but sometimes you'll see some infections and stuff that are caused by um, parasites. The reason that it's really important to know where the infection is coming from is so you know how to treat the infections. Obviously, antibiotics won't work on viruses because antibiotics are designed to kill bacteria. Likewise, antivirals don't work on infections that are caused by bacteria because antivirals are used to treat viruses. Antifungals used to treat Funguses. So that's why it's really important that we know what, um, uh, the, where the cause of the infection is. So then why do we need to know this? Well, we need to know about infection so we can keep our clients safe. We, uh, we have a duty to protect our patients from health care. And unfortunately, um, the latest statistics show that one in 20 hospitalized patients will develop some kind of healthcare associated infection. Now that's horrible folks. Patients are coming in the hospital to get better, not to get sicker. And it's our job to help um, keep those infections away from patients. The other reason we need to know about these infections is so we can protect ourselves from um, disease. I didn't realize that how many deaths were actually associated with infection and the cost, but hospitals spend on average from $28 billion to $33 billion annually for um, health care associated infections. Now that's a lot of money. And um, of those, an infection acquired as a result of us, something that we've done, or did not do, like not washing our hands properly, that costs the healthcare system about $4.5 billion a year. And it's usually from something as simple as not using the appropriate protection mechanisms, like the precautions, or not washing your hands. These are things that are preventable, not performing the skills correctly, using the correct um, asepsis or sterile techniques when you're um, doing the skill. So that's why it's so important because one, patients are getting sick and dying 
and we don't want to be the cause of it. Number two, it costs a lot of money, and you're p becoming a part of the healthcare team now, so you're going to be a part of that cost savings and stuff too. So infection. The spread of infection actually occurs um, because of several reasons. You got a causative agent, a reservoir, uh, a portal of exit where it leaves the reservoir, a mode of transportation, a portal of entry where it enters the body, and then you've got your susceptible host. So I have a great video um, here. I want you to click on this link and watch this video. And I've posted some notes down below that really reviews the um, chain of infection and specifically how, as nurses, what we can do to break that chain of infection. So please take a few minutes and watch this video. Now that you've watched the video, I want you to think like a nurse. So you're working as a nurse on a medical surgical unit. What roles might you play in the chain of infection? What links might you be? What links can you help to break in the chain of infection? So I just want you to take a minute and think about um, like as a nurse, because this is the, the whole reason why you're in school is to become a nurse, right? So now we want to start thinking like a nurse. So how can you help stop infection? And what role do you play in the chain of infection? Can you be a reservoir? Can you spread the pathogens? Um, can you stop it by cleaning up your area? So just I want you to take a few minutes and really think about your role as a nurse and, and the role that you play in this process. Infection occurs in different stages, and it's important for us to understand the different stages for a number of reasons. The first stage, incubation, that is from the time the person is infected till the time that they start having symptoms. Now, an individual can actually infect others um, before they even realize that they're sick which is re why it's really kind of important to understand these stages of infection. The next stage is the prodromal phage, which is like when you start to have some vague symptoms, but you may not have all the symptoms of the disease. One example that I had put in the notes was that maybe you're having a sinus infection going on and you may start with like a mild sore throat. That's one of the first things that starts to happen. I know for me, when I'm getting a sinus infection, I know I'm starting to get a sinus infection when I get that scratchiness in my throat. Now, the illness phase of the infection, that actually occurs when um, you have uh, the symptoms um, that are specific to that infection. During this time, your um, immune um, responses are really ramping up. And you need to get some medical treatment. Um, sometimes in the illness stage is when death can occur because your body just has a poor immune system or it's not responding to the treatment. So the illness phase is a really critical phase for us that are going to be taking care of patients in healthcare settings. The decline phase during this phase is when the therapies are starting to work, the patient's immune system is starting to work, and the pathogens start to reduce. You start to see less. The patient actually starts getting better, and the signs and symptoms of the infection begin to um, go away. Sometimes in this phase, you know, patients, they really start feeling better too, but this is still important for us to make sure we're teaching our patients that just because you feel better doesn't mean that you can't stop taking those antibiotics and stuff. Because um, there still may be a few pathogens still left in your body, um, but your body's able to fight it off. The medical treatments are working. Now, in the convalescence phase, stage of infection, this is when the acute symptoms completely disappear. Your tissue starts to repair, and then you go back to normal. Like, um, you have zero microorganisms in your body. Now, this stage may take, it may be a few days, um, but if you've got a severe infection, this may be months 
for one or two years sometimes before the patients really start to reach this convalescent stage of infection. Infection can be classified um, different ways. One classification is local versus systemic infection. Now when we think of a local infection, um, what's happening is it actually occurs in the limited region of a body. Like for example, uh, urinary tract infection is an infection in your bladder, so that's a local infection. A ear infection is an infection in your ear, it's a local infection. Sinus infection is an infection just in that one region that's considered local. As opposed to a systemic infection, that's where the infection is spread throughout your body. Um, the infection gets in your bloodstream or your lymphatic system and it just spreads throughout your body. And it actually can infect multiple organ systems. When this happens, there's a term that we use, it's called septicemia. That's actually when your whole, your whole septic, that's when your body gets overwhelmed with um, infection. Now primary versus secondary. A primary infection is the first infection that occurs in a patient. So whatever happens first, wherever it originates from, that is your primary infection. Patients that are immunocompromised, um, for example, HIV patients or patients that have prolonged steroid use or sometimes patients with autoimmune diseases, sometimes they can have more than one infection. And their infection may be because of a primary infection. When this occurs, this is called a secondary infection. So that means, it means basically a second infection occurs in the patient's body system and it's usually tied to the fact that they're immunocompromised or something else is happening with them. You see this a lot with um, a patient that is frail and infected with pneumonia, they also may develop um, shingles, which is a viral infection. Sometimes um, uh, patients that have HIV uh, can develop um, different types of infections, which can actually lead to even more infections. Now, the one I really want you to take a, a look at, make some notes on here, is this exogenous versus endogenous. With exogenous, this means it is occurring outside of the body. Um, we see this a lot in healthcare. Healthcare providers need to really determine the source of the pathogens in the patient um, while he's in, he or she is infected in a facility. In exogenous healthcare related infections, the pathogen is acquired from the environment, from the healthcare facility. In an endogenous healthcare related infections, the pathogen is coming from the patient's normal flora when some form of treatment like chemotherapy or antibiotic causes our normally harmless microbes to actually multiply and cause um, infection. One thing that comes to mind is sometimes if you're taking an antibiotic, it can cause you to also have a yeast infection. And this can occur for men and women too. Women tend to have get yeast infections in their genitalia area because warm moist environments um, also another place where uh, yeast can occur a lot is in your mouth so men be careful when you're taking antibiotics too because it can um, that warm moist environment can actually cause the spread of infections there healthcare associated infections are um, they used to be called nosocomial infections. You'll still hear that from time to time. Nosocomial infections. What does that mean? That means you actually got the infection in the hospital. We see these a lot in places like intensive care units where patients are very sick and their immune system is compromised. The best way to prevent these kinds of infections is hand washing. Remember we were talking about when we were going over some hand washing things that clean hands saves lives. Now, some of the common things that you'll see, the healthcare associated infections or nosocomial infections or exogenous infections, um, a lot of times there'll be urinary tract infections, central line infections, wound infections, respiratory infections, 
surgical site infections. Um, these are not always preventable, but most of the time, um, things like these can be prevented just with following the protocols and washing our hands and and that type those types of those types of things. Now, acute versus um, chronic is basically exactly what it sounds like. An acute infection is some that just happens all of a sudden. And then when you get into the more chronic types of infections, those are things that patients have over time. And they, they you may have had this for um, uh, several, several months. Sometimes when we think of chronic um, infections, we think of like in your bones, patients can get well, something called osteomyelitis, and that's an infection in your bones. That can take months, sometimes even years for the patient to really recover, and they may actually even end up losing that extremity, that limb, because of an infection that's in your bone. Sometimes patients that have um, compromised immune systems like HIV, they can end up with something that's called an uh, latent infection, and that's where um, the infection presents with no kind of symptoms. But you'll see some of that stuff. But the biggest thing is acute is rapid onset. Uh, like common colds is an acute infection. And chronic is just a slow development. It takes a while for that to develop. I have a question for you here. Uh, question is, a client living with AIDS develops an oral hairy leukoplakia. An infection caused by the Epstein var virus. The leukoplaca is considered a. Just, I want you to think for a minute. What type of infection is this? What's going on with the patient? The correct answer is actually D, a secondary infection. Um, the patient's primary infection is actually HIV because HIV is a virus. And because of the HIV that the patient has, they are immunocompromised and it makes them more susceptible to the development of a secondary infection. So good job if you got it correct. Sometimes our patients um, develop something that we call like superbugs. And what this is is drug resistant pathogens. And that's the reason we call them superbugs because it takes a lot to actually get rid of this infection because it has so a tolerance for a lot of different antibiotics. I just want to listen, list a couple here for you. Some of the most common ones that you're going to see in practice. Um, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus MRSA, vancomycin resistant enterococci VRE, and colostrum difficilin, which is C. diff. These organisms are said to be drug resistant um, or multi resistant. Sometimes folks use the word interchangeably. And these are some of the most difficult things to treat when you're in a hospital setting. If you get a patient that's elderly and they contact one of these, it can really, really wipe them out and make them very sick. And a lot of times they end up even in the ICU setting when they develop some of this stuff. So what is Staphylococcus? Arius. It actually lives on our skin and in our nose. Usually, you guys probably have it on your skin too and nose, and it doesn't really cause us any problems. When we have a staph infection, normally that is treated with methicillin, but when you have MRSA, the, the normal treatment for staph infection doesn't work, so the methicillin can't work. Because MRSA can survive on our hands, our clothes, environmental surfaces, and equipment, it spreads really fast, and especially in the healthcare setting because we're touching everything. Um, so we have to be really careful in the healthcare institutions to make sure that we are doing a lot of good education about MRSA. We're doing aggressive hand um, washing. You can use alcohol-based hand rubs for patients with MRSA, but you need to make sure that you are washing your hands 20 to 30 seconds 
before you're touching um, a patient or anything. Make sure that you're also using protective gown and glove when you are taking care of these patients. This patient will be on isolation because it is so serious. Now, vancomycin, enterococci, that is actually a um, bacteria that normally resides in our intestines and the female um, genital tract. So most of the VRE infections occur in hospitals and um, the spread is attributed to not following good hand hygiene and infection control um, measures. VRE is the leading cause of healthcare acquired bacteremia, which is bacteria in the blood, surgical wounds, and urinary tract. Some risk factors include previous long-term antibiotic treatments, a weakened immune system, having a surgical procedure, long-term devices like folks that have to have urinary catheters for several months at a time. Some folks have urinary catheters permanently. So we have to really be careful uh, about um, VRE, especially in our clients, older clients and debilitated clients like spinal cord injuries that have to have urinary catheters on a permanent basis. They're at risk for the VRE. The C. difficile is, pretty, is a unique um, infection. It's actually caused by spores. It affects about 3% of our, actually about 3% of adults are carriers of C. difficile, but it's not really harmful um, until the antibiotics that we're taking destroys our good bacteria that's in our intestines that protects us against the disease. The C. difficile strain that's out now is resistant to almost all antibiotics and it causes sepsis and it can cause intestinal damage. Patients may need to have their colon removed. Uh, this can cause death. This C. difficile thrives in a hospital environment. The thing I want you to make sure that you remember with this is because C. difficile is spores. They can survive for days on surfaces such as doorknobs, toilet seats, uh, um, we have to be careful. Hand washing with soap and water must be done. You cannot, cannot, cannot use an alcohol-based hand scrub because C. difficile um, is from spores. Now, if you're cleaning or disinfecting like the countertop, the surfaces, let's say you've had a patient in the room that had C. difficile, now they've been discharged home or something, you have to use a bleach-containing disinfectant to clean the surfaces in the environment. You can't just just use those um, sanitary wipes that they have in the hospital setting. Yeah, it has to be bleach wipes or bleach spray because that's the only thing that will kill those sporins. Our body actually does a great job trying to protect us against defenses. We have some primary defensives that really limit the pathogen entry into our bodies. One is intact skin, our mucous membranes, our tears. We have normal flora in our GI tract and normal flora in our um, urinary tract. So if we've got healthy, resilient, tough skin, that really helps bacteria from getting in to our body or any kind of pathogens really. If our mucous membranes are nice and moist, our trachea is covered in mucous membranes, our nares are covered in mucous membranes, we have hair in our nose, our sinuses, all of those things actually help us to um, prevent those pathogens from coming in. We actually, uh, the other thing that happens with our mucous membranes is they stimulate us to cough and sneeze and forcefully expel pathogens from our respiratory tract. Our tears actually produce, our glands and that produce our tears also produce antimicrobial enzymes. So our tears are actually washing away uh, um, infective organisms from our eyes, like 
when you get something in your eye, you you automatically start tearing up, right? So that our that's our body's defense mechanism to make sure we don't get um infection and stuff in our eye. In our bowel, in our intestines, we have normal flow. We have bacteria in our intestine that actually is good. Um, that helps protect us but we also have a lot of acid in our stomach and pathogens do not like acidic environments so a lot of times our stomach helps to get rid of some of those uh, pathogens now sometimes pathogens may get past our stomach and the acid and get to our intestines when that does we have something called bile that can help um, protect us against those pathogens and then the last thing is our body wants to get rid of anything that's bad that's in it so when that happens we have diarrhea there's vomiting um to get the our body says get them out get rid of them and so we we really get rid of um pathogens very effectively in our body in our urinary tract we have uh our urinary tract is protected by mucous membranes. We have epithelial cells that help secrete mucus uh, to help with the pathogens. Our urine is actually acidic that helps with um, pathogens and stuff. That's one reason they tell you to whenever you feel like you're starting to get like a urinary tract infection or something to drink some cranberry juice because what cranberry juice does is actually make your urine more acidic and the acidity in your urine fights off infections for um, females the acidity in your vagina actually helps to fight off um, infections so our body is does an excellent job at help protecting us we also have secondary um, defenses in our body, phagocytosis, a um, complement cascade, inflammation, fever. I'm sure you learned actually about this stuff in pathophysiology when you were going over immunity and infection. So I'm not actually going to spend some time, um, a lot of time here because you just have learned about this stuff this summer. But um, just just remember that stuff. Our body has... Um, other mechanisms aside from just the outside primary things from the infection getting in our body but once the infection does get in our body we have these secondary defenses that can really help with um fighting off that infection in addition to our secondary defenses against infection we also have tertiary defenses against infection again this is something that you probably learned about in your pathophysiology class with the humoral immunity like our b cell production where we we actually produce antibodies and our cell mediated uh, immunity with our t cells so i'm not going to go over this you won't be tested on this part because this is really patho stuff but i just wanted to remind you again of the c it all carries over the stuff that you learn in patho and anatomy it, it is relevant here so um uh that immunity is a very um intricate thing that happens in our body and i just find it so amazing how our body knows how to protect itself and really does a great job on a daily basis of protecting us against infection i've listed for you here some factors that actually put you at more risk for having infection uh, in the notes there's a lot of um, more description about that but the two things i really want to point out here is developmental stage um, which is the old population and the younger population so our geriatric patients and then our baby our babies our new infants pediatric population those two groups of folks are really more at risk for developing um, infections because they have a changes in their physiology or their immune system is not um, developed as good or their immune system responses are, are not working as good so um, the developmental stage really can put you at risk for infection and that's why those folks really need to make sure um, that we are trying to avoid some of the other th things the other risk factors um, so that we're not putting them at an even more increased risk 
The other thing I want to mention on this slide, because they, but they're all all these things are important, but nursing and medical procedures. The reason I'm stopping here is because we can call we're a risk factor. Nurses are risk factors for patients for infection. That's why hand hygiene is so important for us. So please remain cognitive of that as you are in your facilities taking care of your patients that we can cause infection to these patients and we we can do some things to help our immune system, getting plenty of rest, eating a balanced diet, maintaining good hygiene, reducing the stress, getting those immunizations. I cannot stress enough the importance of getting your flu shot during flu season. And that's for the elderly population, for the pediatric population, for the healthcare workers, um, medical professions. So, uh, I cannot stress enough um, the importance of maintaining your health. Even now, as you're nursing students in school, you're at risk for developing infections because one, you're super stressed. You have several of those risk factors listed on the previous slide. But the way to help that, to combat that, is make sure you're trying to eat good, drinking plenty of water, make sure you're resting and exercising. You're going to have to get your flu shot for nursing school, but make sure that you're also trying to do some strategies to help reduce your stress because I know like, huh, that's like probably seems like a goal that's unattainable but but really try to focus on your health um while you're here in nursing school and do some things that help support your um defense so as nurses what do we do about infection our job is to teach our clients and our colleagues about infection control. We have to follow the policies. If a patient is supposed to be on isolation, we need to wear the correct um, resources. We need to wear a gown and a mask and a glove, and we got to follow the protocols. We need to teach our patients and their families about the protocols. One thing I do want to stop here and make a note of, is before you begin any procedure, because I had, did not mention this earlier, with anything that involves aseptic technique and you're going to be wearing gloves and that type of thing, you want to always make sure that you're asking and verifying that your patient does not have a latex allergy because we do not want to put our client in danger. Um, and if your client does have, or your patient does have a latex allergy, make sure that you're using latex free gloves um, when you are taking care of them and equipment like the Foley catheters need to be latex free and the supplies that you use, make sure you're using latex free um, products. I forgot to mention that earlier, so I wanted to stop here and take a minute to do that. So spread the knowledge not the infection teach our patients teach their families teach your families education is key and wash your hands one way we prevent infection is through medical asepsis so what exactly is a medical asepsis basically it's a state of cleanliness that decreases the potential for the spread of infection. You're, you practice medical asepsis all the time and you don't even realize it. At home, you wash your hands after you use the bathroom. You wash your hands before you eat your food. You wash your hands while you're cooking. You wash your utensils. You wash your plates. You wash your spoons and forks. You clean your house. You, your bathroom and bathtub and stuff is clean before you get in and go to take a, a bath. So we, we promote a state of cleanliness all the time. Um, the big thing here is hand washing and hand hygiene. That is the most, the most important thing that you can do to control infection and decrease infection. Clean care is safe care when anytime you're doing anything in the healthcare environment uh, make sure that you are using clean care clean up after yourself wash your hands clean your area how do we maintain a clean environment it's pretty simple if something spilled clean it up 
when you're washing your hands and there are water splatters on the sink, clean it up. If there's a patient um, in your room that's on isolation or they're coughing all in the room, clean the bedside tables. Remove clutter. Clear clear supplies um, out of the way. If you take anything, and, the, and I'm just going to make a note here, if you take anything into a patient's room that is on some kind of contact or droplet or isolation, it has to stay in that room. Like any kind of supplies, any tape, any bandages, any dressing changes, anything that you take in that room stays in that patient's room and it's thrown away when that patient leaves or it's thrown away after you use it. So make sure that you only take into the rooms what you need so that we're not wasting supplies because when a supply is brought into that room, it's considered contaminated. And I can't say this enough, wash your hands, wash your hands. Wash your hands when you go on the unit. Wash your hands when you leave the unit. Wash your hands after you use the bathroom. Wash your hands after, before and after you have client contact. In, in the healthcare settings, we foam in, foam out. That means we use that alcohol-based hand rub before we go in the patient's room. And then we use it when we exit the patient's room. Wash your hands before and after you have contact with client belongings. Wash your hands after you take your gloves off. Wash your hands if you're gonna after you eat. Wash your hands after you've touched contaminated um, things. Like, like if you're in there touching your patient's bedside table, you need to wash your hands. Wash your hands if they look visibly soiled or dirty. So I can't stress enough the importance of washing your hands for the prevention of infection. You have been learning about hand hygiene. You have been practicing hand hygiene. I just want to remind you again one more time. These are the guidelines uh, for washing your hands. You need to wash your hands for at least 15 seconds. What does that mean, 15 seconds? I tell my patients, my family, um, the students, that when you're washing your hands, if you'll sing the happy birthday song, or if you'll sing your ABCs, that's usually about 15 seconds. So you know you've done a good job. Now, if you are in the OR or in a surgical setting, you may be washing your hands from two to six minutes. It's a surgical scrub. It's very specific, the things that they do. When you're washing your hands, remove your jewelry. Clean underneath your fingernails. You're going to want to use um, some kind of bacterial side solution or water and, and warm water. Uh, when you're washing your hands. Make sure the water is warm, not hot, because you don't want to burn yourself. Make sure that you got plenty of soap on your hand. Make sure you're rubbing them really good and that you're rinsing all the soap off. Your, um, your towel drying off your hands. You use that towel to turn off the faucet and then you dispose of your towel. Just We cannot stress enough the importance of hand washing. I have another question for you here. Which of the following actions violate a principle that is key to proper hand washing at the bedside? A. Wash your hands for one minute. True or false? B. Shaking your hands dry over the sink. True or false? C. Using warm, not very hot water. True or false? D. Using the soap provided by the agency. So let's just look at this question really quick. You're, the question is asking you what action violates the principle. So what is not a part of the principle? Is washing your hands for one minute a part of the principle? True or false? We need to wash our hands for at least 15 seconds. But is one minute okay? Yes. Is shaking your hands dry over the sink a part of the principle? True or false? How do you dry your hands? Do you shake them to dry them or do you dry them with a towel? C. Is using warm, not very hot water a part of the principle? Do we want to use warm water? Because what happens when we use hot water? We can risk burning ourselves. Is using the soap provided by the agency acceptable? True or false? The healthcare agencies will provide um, 
antimicrobial soaps for you to wash your hands with. So you will use the soap in the room, in the bathroom that's provided by the agency. So the correct answer for this would be the one statement that violates the principle is shaking your hands over the sink because we know we're not going to do that. The CDC tells us that we need to use standard precautions. Now, I want you to get this. Standard precautions with every patient in all settings, regardless of if the patient has an infection or not. So what is standard precautions? Standard precaution is hand hygiene. Is protecting ourselves from exposure is decreasing the transmission of pathogens, is protecting the client from pathogens carried by healthcare workers, is safe injection practices, is using the cough etiquette, cover your cough. That's a standard precaution that we should be doing. If you're doing certain skills, like one example is like a lumbar puncture, um, when they, they're actually inserting a needle into the spinal fluid you always wear a mask for that that's a standard practice that we do so for standard precautions you do for all patients in all settings regardless of if they have an infection or not contact precautions are important and necessary if the client has a pathogen that is spread by direct contact uh, some sources of this infection could be wounds, drainage, secretions. And when I say secretions, that could be any kind of secretion. Urinary secretions, bowel secretions, even saliva. Um, also, uh, the pathogens can be spread with the supplies like the beds. Remember, anything it touches, you come in contact with, so it could live on the bedside tables, the covers, the gowns. So just be mindful of that. If a person is on contact precautions, it's really designed to protect nurses, caregivers, healthcare professionals, and, and the visitors who are in the patient's room. Anybody that's going to be within three feet of a client in direct contact with them needs to be on um, use contact precaution. We call it contact isolation precautions now I just want to list here a couple of infections that you might see with this is if a patient has RSV Shigella enteric diseases um, wound infections herpes simplex Tygo, scabies and multi-drug resistant organisms like from the previous slides we talked about MRSA VRE C. difficilin with contact precautions, those folks need a private room or, or if they're in a room with someone else, they need to be in a room with another client who has the exact same infection. Nurses, healthcare providers, caregivers, family members, they need to wear gown and gloves whenever they're in the room and come within three feet of the patient. And we're going to make sure that we're disposing of infectious dressings, any materials, anything that's actually touched the patient into a non-porous bag without touching the outside of the bag. And it actually goes into like a biohazard type um, bag. So contact precautions is very serious uh, in the healthcare setting. If your patient is on a droplet precaution, that means that they have a pathogen that is spread via moist droplets in the air from coughing, sneezing, touching contaminated objects. Um, any droplet that's larger than five micrograms that can travel three to six feet from the client, uh, the client is going to need to be on droplet precautions. Some things here, I'll just list a couple things here for you that you may see. Some conditions, bacteria, viruses, diseases, streptococcal pharyngitis or pneumonia, influenza, scarlet fever, rubella, pertussis, mumps, mycoplasm, pneumonia, sepsis, uh, pneumonic plague, whenever. So you see there's a lot of things that we use droplet precautions for. But whenever droplet precautions are required, this patient also needs a private room 
or they can share a room with someone that has the same infectious disease. But we need to make sure that the client has their own equipment. And with this, the patients need to wear a mask. The patients, the health, not the patients, sorry, I'm sorry, not the patients, the visitors need to wear a mask. The nurses and healthcare providers need to wear a mask uh, or some kind of eye protection and mask if you're um, within three feet of the patient. And then we're going to follow the standard precautions of hand washing and, um, uh, you know, hand hygiene, making sure that we are make it, washing our hands. With airborne precautions, this is something that you'll see if the pathogen um, or the infection is smaller than five micrograms. Um, remember with the droplet precaution, if it was greater than the five micrograms, we could use droplet precaution. But if the pathogen or the infection is smaller than five micrograms, we'll need to use airborne precautions. Now, examples of that are measles, varicella, chickenpox, pulmonary or laryngeal tuberculosis. So in these cases, we'll need to follow the airborne precaution. The pathogen is spread via the air currents. You need to make sure um, that you're not shaking the sheets, you're not sweeping the floor. Um, the ventilation system can actually transfer the pathogens. These rooms have special um, ventilation systems so that the air does not flow outside of the room. Um, it's, it's like a reverse process with the ventilation. They have to have a private room. Um, a mask and a respiratory protection are required for caregivers and visitors. The type of mask that we have to use is called an N95 mask or a special HEPA respirator which is a high efficiency particulate air respirator, HEPA, H-E-P-A, if you think the client has got um, tuberculosis. Now, remember when I said the ventilation systems, the air doesn't actually go out of the room. It's like a negative pressure airflow um, and it uh, exchanges air in the room about every six to 12 exchanges per hour. If splashing or spraying is possible to occur, like if you're doing a dressing change, you think that you might get some, or if your patient's coughing and you think you're sneezing and you think they might be spraying you with their cough and sneeze, you may want to think about, you, you may want to wear a full face mask, eyes, nose, mouth to protect you. This is very serious um, in the nursing program because you have to be fitted for the mask that you're going to wear. You won't actually have a patient that has airborne precautions because you actually have to go and get fitted. But when you are a nurse and you take care of these patients, um, make sure that you are following the protocol because this is not uh, an infection that you want to take home. I have another question here for you. The client has a draining abdominal wound that has become infected with MRSA. In caring for the client, the nurse will implement A, contact precautions, B, droplet precautions, C, no precautions, or D, airborne precautions. So what kind of precautions would you use in a patient that has MRSA? And that answer is actually... A, contact precautions. Anytime you have a patient with those multi-drug resistant organisms, MRSA, VRE, C. difficile, they are going to be on contact precautions. Protective isolation is another type of isolation that I want to actually talk about. In this case, the patient actually does not have an infection but the patient is immunocompromised and at great risk for developing an infection. So we actually want to protect the patient from us and protect the patient from the hospital environment and all the thing, all the germs and stuff that are in the environment. So this is actually called protective isolation. Uh, sometimes it's referred to reverse isolation. 
This is really used with clients who have a low white blood cell count, clients that are getting chemotherapy, uh, clients that have that are really in a state of um, their immunocompromise. And what we're doing with this is you follow the standard precautions already that you would follow with any patient. But you make sure that this client's room has got a lot of <clears throat> really good ventilation. There's no carpeting. Um, there's no plants. There's no live plants in the room. You want to make sure there's no standing water like the client's not allowed to have a humidifier. Um, you want to make sure that the nurse that's taking care of this client does not have any other patients that have any other isolations that are really infectious because if when patients are really immunocompromised if they get one small infection that could actually be fatal for them and so we want to make sure that the nurse does not have any other clients that have an active um, infection the other thing that we do is in addition to just washing our hands you may we'll put on a mask and our other protective um, personal protective equipment like our gown and mask and gloves because we really don't want to give the patient any germs that may be even on our uniform on our hands um, because they are already sick enough in units like a NICU neonatal intensive care they do this all the time in units like burn units um, like some special Sometimes with ICU patients, you'll see this. And really what we're trying to do is to protect the patient. That's why it's called protective isolation. We put the patient in isolation to protect them. The last thing that I want to talk about is surgical asepsis. So we talked about medical asepsis, which means like the clean environment. You're making sure everything is clean. But surgical asepsis is actually a little bit different. With surgical asepsis, the environment is absolutely clean, but what you are doing is creating a sterile environment, a sterile work area, using sterile equipment and supplies to take care of your patient. Now, there is different levels um, of asepsis when you're using the sterile technique. A sterile technique is you're using sterile gloves and sterile supplies, so everything is sterile. There are times where there's a modified sterile technique where you use your gloves aren't sterile. You use some non-sterile procedure gloves, but all of the supplies that you're using to take care of your patient are sterile. And then when sometimes we do stuff um, not sterile, but we use a clean technique where we use clean hands, non-sterile gloves, and clean supplies like fresh open clean supplies out of the packet they may not necessarily be sterile supplies um, one thing that comes to mind is tap water we may use tap water when we're irrigating a ng tube or peg, peg tube or something and we um, are using a clean technique we're using our gloves we've washed our hands we're using our standard precautions and we're following a, a clean technique but it's not necessarily a sterile procedure now you will see some sterile things you will have a there is a surgical hand scrub that you're going to learn how to do in the lab there's surgical attire that you're going to put on there's sterile gloves and sterile gloves come with a lot of different procedures like one that comes to mind is fully catheter care whenever you're inserting a foreign object into a patient um, like specifically like into the bladder that really needs to be sterile technique so we'll use a sterile catheter sterile gloves you set up a sterile field like your workspace where all your supplies are everything there set up you're going to learn how to set up a sterile field i'm not going to go over the checklist for that because that is something that you're going to practice in lab but just know when you're setting up these sterile fields and using these sterile supplies and stuff this is called surgical asepsis basically it's just using sterile equipment using sterile technique using sterile supplies to take care of your patients so i hope this hasn't been too painful i know um, it's a lot of information thrown at you and, and some of this stuff will be reiterated in the lab or you, it's, you've seen it in your readings, you've looked at it on your module. So, so this actually shouldn't be the first time that you're here. So the, some of the stuff you've, you've gotten in pathophysiology, this is old hat by now. Um, but 
as always, if you have any questions or if something's just really not clear, you're like, Miss Rand, I really don't understand this concept. Can you please provide some more explanation? Please just let me know. Send me an email. Put a question in our discussion board, um, and I will be happy to sit with you, talk with you, send you a message, see if we can clear up any questions that you have. And I hope you have an excellent day. And remember, wash your hands. Clean hands save lives.